let's see. Hey guys, thanks for joining us today. Um, I've got a, a, a really con a really exciting conversation lined up today. How's it, Adrian? Um, thanks for joining us again, Jill. Um, I'm going to be chatting with um, a good friend of mine um, by the name of Steve Benjamin, um, aka Animal Ocean. Um, how's it, Dan? Good to see you on Instagram Live. Uh, thanks for following us today. Um, so yeah, we're chatting to Steve Benjamin, um, aka Animal Ocean today. Um, he's a dear friend of mine um, and we're going to see if we can connect with him shortly. Um, he's currently based in Cape Town and we're going to be really talking um, all things marine, wildlife, um, specifically around Cape Town, uh, learn a little bit more about um, Steve Benjamin and how he got involved um, with regards to photography um, and um, specifically underwater photography. Um, as well as some of um, you know the awesome encounters that he has. Um, also, we're going to be chatting a little bit about the sardine run, which I think a lot of us in South Africa know a little bit about, um, but certainly Steve's going to be able to provide a lot more info um, and, um, and give us some feedback with regards to some of his experience as well while actually following the sardine run. So let's see if I can connect with Steve and we'll, we'll kick off. It's like we're connecting. Steve! Yay! James, hello! How are you, my friend? So nice to be here. Hi. Yeah, good to be talking to you, man. And it looks like the signal um, is going to be good for us. So um, looking forward to chatting to you today. And thanks for making the time, man. I see... Um, there are a lot of people who are hot tuned in and I'm, I'm really interested to, to hear some of the stories and, and learn more about what you do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can see some of my friends, Rob Hope coming on and it's, yeah, I just, we've put it out and I think we've got a lot to share and a lot of interesting things to touch on. I've always thought your background was very similar to mine, but on the terrestrial bush side. And so I, just, I really like talking to you anyway about all things wildlife. I think you've, you've got a, a great knowledge of of things and I, I hope we can share that with the audience this uh, this afternoon really well afternoon here in south africa well that's very kind steve and um you know right back at you um you know i think i probably speak on behalf of most of south africa when i when i salute you on being so incredibly proactive you know during this challenging time with regards to um you know just the images that you've been um you know you know get, putting together and uh, i believe shot all from uh, from your garden <laughs> yeah absolutely um firstly that that photo makes me look it's great like the photo i definitely wouldn't be, i'm glad you chose it eh? um actually a, a good friend of ours sasha specker helped take that photo so it was a cool moment um, yeah, I've just been really trying to use this time as best as possible, you know, given the, the circumstances we have. You know, I'm stuck at home. We have to focus on things that are with us. So at first, that was really, you know, working through the hard drives, as I think most photographers and filmmakers were doing, trying to catalog your life, trying to, you know, digest all those things that you've done, but never really had the time to um, sort out properly. Um, and I got about 50% of the way through before I needed that fix of taking a photograph of something, anything would do. Um, and yeah, and that really, you know, got me on this whole thinking process of what can I do locally? You know, a, a lot of companies like film, film companies were asking me like, you know, what can you do given the restrictions? Um, and so as, long, as, lo as well as working on the sunbirds in my garden, I've also been trying to work on proposals and working, working on conservation stories that hopefully after this lockdown period is over, we're able to like get going on right away. And have you, have you found anything like that for yourself? What have you been doing in the last while? No, I mean, I, we've also, you know, try to be as, um, you know, proactive as possible. I think for me, um, you know, these conversations that we have started, um, you know, making quite a regular thing and we're, we're trying to have conversations with people like yourself on a, a weekly basis um, and engaging with people in a, a similar space has really been so rewarding for me personally. 
Um, and then, yeah, with regards to um, our team, we've, we've currently got a permit and working with, um, with Sia Khaleesi um, and his foundation. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Sia Khaleesi is our rugby uh, World Cup, or he led us to the, the World Cup uh, final last year and actually won that for South Africa. Um, so, so that's been really great, Steve. Um, and yeah, I mean, again, like you, I think have also felt the challenges, you know, being in the, the tourism industry and, you know, that's certainly front of mind. So it, it has definitely been a challenge. And while kind of my eyes have been open to a number of things that possibly, you know, I wasn't thinking about, you know, prior this chapter that we find ourselves in, um, you know, there are certainly the realities, uh, you know, that we, that we face every day and, and that's, you know, how do we move forward um, in the tourism space? So um, I know that's close you to your heart too. Yeah, absolutely. I see a uh, Callum is logged in. He's a, a guy that takes lots of great photos. I always enjoy his Instagram profile. And um, yeah, the tourism space is in big trouble. Um, you know, COVID, social distancing, people's livelihoods are lost. People are losing their lives all over the world. It really is a, a world meltdown. We're all stuck at home because of that. So tourism's I mean, who knows how long it's going to be affected for. It might be a year, maybe two years. I don't know what sectors are going to come back first. But um, James, just for our audience, my, a large part of my income is sharing wildlife experiences on the water, uh, particularly with Cape fur seals here in Cape Town. So that's what we do most days is facilitate snorkeling groups to go out and experience the ocean. Uh, we also help out filmmakers and all kinds of people too but that is really our bread and butter so now that that is shut down we obviously um trying to do the best we can but we have to uh, like stick within the rules and the law and respect everyone's space and everyone's safety as a priority so for now i think it's really going to be um for me film shoots and film productions to try create an income and to try work around this project uh, this problem that the world is facing you're probably doing something similar. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's, and that's why it's so interesting to speak to, you know, people like yourself in a, in a similar space. Um, and I think everyone um, is having to think out the box and, and certainly be creative with regards to, to the road going forward. Um, but again, I just want to, I want to go back to commending totally. you on, um, you know, on, on being, you know, so productive during this time. And I think, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, I, t I, t I take my hat off to you. Um, and I actually want to just, I just want to chat about that a little bit, if that's okay. Yes, absolutely, before, absolutely. Before we, um, before we, we hear a little bit more about kind of you and, um, and, and how you ended up doing what you do, I'm going to bring up a photograph, if that's okay, okay with, yeah, well, with you. That, that's a great photo. <laughs> yeah. It's, I, um, the, I, can see the, I can see the news, the print, that's it though. Let me, let me, let me bring up another one. So here we go. This, this, this should work. Oh, wait. Uh, it's close. Oh, there we go. There are. That's a How's banger. It? That's an amazing shot. So, it looks like, a, looks like an orange-breasted um, sunbird to me. And I think, you know, um, Steve, if you, could, if you could just give us like a little bit of a background as to, you know, what's going on here. And, and for those of you who don't know, um, you know, just what you've been up to specifically with regards to this project you've undertaken. <laughs> totally. Okay. I'll talk all about it. Um, I wonder if this will work. If I... There we go. Okay. So I live over there. So I live in a little house. We're on a mountain right near the, this fire break. It's very full of fanboys. And if you look just over there, I'm very close to Cork Bay Harbor and, and the, the ocean. So I live in quite a wildlife rich spot. Um, let me flip this around. And there's a lot, because of this wilderness around me, I've got a lot of sunbirds in my garden. And I really, I've never had the time to focus on taking great photos of them or even half decent photos of them. But you know, like that's what lockdown gives us is time. So I really want to focus my attention on trying to produce the best photos that I could make given my equipment around the house. So because I'm an underwater photographer, I had um, some dive torches and some strobe arms. And I knew that I needed to figure out a way to get some studio lighting techniques onto that. And what I mean by that is just you know, really highlighting those colors and the sheen and the details of those birds, because often they're lost in just normal light. I mean, they're very beautiful always, but it's nicer to try and make them really pop. 
And so I noticed that some of the bushes were dark. And if I use a, sl a, a high shutter speed, I could really make that background, uh, that background as black as possible. And the first step was actually just posting GoPro videos on Facebook and seeing people's reactions. I think people really love just that little injection of nature into their lives, um, particularly local nature. I think that really, really struck a chord with people because you know, a lot of people are in homes without a lot of natural world around them and they're really craving that outdoor t touch. And I, I really wanted to post regularly so that people could see the progress of, the, like, of my little project. And that's what I, 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 sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, that's what fair. I loved so much about it was, um, was the progress. Like you actually, you, you know, you, you didn't kind of work behind closed doors and, you know, no. come up with an image like this. We got to see kind of your shortfalls, your, your shortfalling and, and, and eventually, you know, coming up with some incredible imagery. Yeah, I, I made a point of like trying to put it on, on Instagram stories and Facebook. I, I put it first on Instagram. That's definitely my, like my main go-to, easy to access. And I'm, I'm like never scared on Instagram stories. That stuff only lasts a while and it's real and you just put it out and you build on it. Um, and you know what? If, if I just put out awesome photos of sunbirds one, at one go, it, it wouldn't have had the same sort of leverage. I think the journey was as important which is why I made that whole behind the scenes video because I'm not the kind of guy that wants to take amazing photos and then like hold them to myself. I want to show people the process and like give them the inspiration to try to do it themselves because social media for me is really about the viewer and about people watching because you, you want to engage with people that help you on the other side do things better, like learning photographic techniques, you know, places to go, trips to go on, you name it. So, I think the Sunbird project was, was, a, was partly that, but also partly me just trying to uh, not waste time, but to spend time on something I hadn't done before. No, awesome. And, and again, um, hats, off you, hats off to you, Steve. You, you seem to get a lot of coverage um, and, and interest. Um, <laughs> yeah. There were, I mean, obviously I had a, a picture of the Cape Times there, which, which some of you might have seen. Um, who else approached you with regards to wanting to learn more about this awesome project? Okay, so at first it was obviously all local. And then um, Cape Times started, was a, was a kickoff. A friend of mine, Olivia Jones, who's a communication expert, she put it out to all her media contacts. And it, it went into Forbes Africa, like an online magazine there, which was, which was nice. Um, but there was, I did a CNN interview the other day. And it was Amazing. linked to the underwater photography, but you know, also about the sunbirds because it's, the story is interesting because it's during lockdown. It's, it's, it's myself trying to adapt to these times. And these are they're very, very beautiful photos. Um, the, there was a big one on Monday, uh, Peter Pixel, which is a very large online gallery in the States, put it up. And that really took it out of the local South African area into a more international stage. So I, yeah, it's, it's been as much a sort of me media, um, cir not circus, but it's been really fun to have people contacting me about this. Um, and at the same time, I was trying to scratch together my website because it, I, it wasn't really great before. The, it's, not, it's not as good as it can be now, but it really gave me focus to try uh, improve it so that people could see the photos and buy them if they wanted to. And then also put up those screensavers and desktop backgrounds because... Yes. I really wanted an easy purchase for like not a lot of money. So threw those up there. Um, so I think after this lockdown period, it's really going to, I'm going to have a lot more content on my websites and things that are approachable for people. So I'm, I'm ha very happy about that. Awesome, man. Actually, no, good for you. Do you have any more fun? There we go. I got one here. So let me, let me show you a couple more shots. So this is a, this is one of my favorite shots. This is a, a male malachite sunbird resting on a hot poker. And when this happened, I was just like absolutely awestruck. Like to have one of these birds land in front of you and stare at the camera is just amazing. Just a moment and a half. But I've got, there's another little treat. If you don't mind me, can I play a little video for you? Yeah, let's see if our connection holds up. I'm sure it'll work. Okay. So the sunbirds are great. I'm still working at them a bit. But there's a much harder subject, and that's the porcupines that are behind my garden. And they no are absolutely addicted to butternut. There's nothing they will not do for a piece of butternut. 
Um, if you, you must have bumped into porcupines in your, in your bush days quite a bit, James. Yeah, we find them, you know, I actually, believe it or not, have um, a pair in front of my house in Hart Bay. We very rarely see them. Um, but yeah, we've, we've got a number of um, porcupines, I guess, that frequent the lodges. And, uh, and like you say, I think that often has something to do with the, the chef sneakily feeding them some butternut or, or the like. You know? <laughs> so I've been using a, a camera trap, a Bushnell camera trap um, and GoPros with my video lights. And I've been putting them out around my neighborhood. Um, the porcupines come and steal my dog food. They, I've even slept outside to try to see if I can find them and had them come and <laughs> sniff my head. But I put together just a little short one minute video. Let me see if this works out here. There we go. So that is actually, a, that's a, a mongoose with a bird. And these are my dogs, La Marlon and Lady, and this is where I live. But at night, well, you can see my reflection quite strongly there, but it's all good. So this is this is literally just outside your um, your house. Oh, there we yeah, go. There's a mongoose. garage by my house. So it's in my back garden. There's a, my setting my GoPros up and walking away. And at night, for unknown any any hour of the day, there's there's a family of three that come out and here. The prelude. <laughs> but they do not like light. That's the one thing. Eh? Classic. Eh? Look at that. Yeah, as a youngster. I mean, isn't that just the best rodent? I mean, that's a rodent that is designed to defend itself against lions. I mean, that is unbelievable. Like, I am. Yeah, it's like a, it's a. And you know, they're made for, I think they're made for life and they, and they have a very tight knit little family unit. So, I mean, they're really, really special creatures. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, I think, a second to the capybara, it's the largest rodent, or certainly the largest rodent in Africa. And people don't realize, but those, uh, those quills that you're having a look at are actually modified hairs. So, I mean, so lucky that you got to see um, and that you get to see, you know, these animals, you know, so close to home. And, um, you know, it's funny that, that also was something that, you know, you introduced me to. And, you know, while I had this experience in, in, um, in going out to, you know, the bush and spending a lot of time in, 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 in various wilderness areas, um, I, I think it was actually Sasha Specker who shares your love for the yeah. ocean that introduced the two of us. Um, and, and I, I was just blown away by, um, what you introduced me to on our doorstep, you know, and obviously with the use of the boat and, and just being thrown into a completely unique world, which, um, which, you know, I don't know too much about. I'm more of a terrestrial, terrestrial guy, as you say. Um, and yeah, I was just blown away by your knowledge and, um, and, and, and how well you knew the animals and the, and the species within the, you know, the Western Cape ecosystem and obviously, you know, um, around Southern Africa. Um, so, so, so Steve, I thought maybe um, we could start off by, um, you know, learning a little bit more about you and uh, how you ended up uh, doing what you do, ah. uh, what, <laughs> what, what, what you studied, where it all began. Um, and, um, and yeah, give us, give us the scoop. We've only got an hour to chat, I'm afraid. So um, It's gonna... been 18 minutes already. I can't believe it. Wow. Yeah. It's... <laughs> um, I just saw a cool question there. Callum asked me. Um, have I ever seen any caracals around my house? And I, I haven't seen them yet. So they apparently are around here, Callum, and hopefully I get to see one on the camera trap at some point. Um, uh, you know, if you follow the Urban Caracal Project, you'll see all the movements, so we'll get there. Um, but that photo that you, you see over there, that's me when I was about 14 years old, and I was a volunteer in the Two Oceans Aquarium. So a little bit of a backstory, you know, I was at... Um, I was at school in Berkeley Primary, which is here in the southern suburbs. And one of my teachers was a guy called Russell Stevens. And he was instrumental in sort of forming my trajectory in life. He, did a re he, had, he had contacts with the two oceans and he got together who work and volunteer at the aquarium. Um, and he did this just by asking everyone to write a project or pick a topic and write a paper about it. And he chose myself and Rob Hope and a couple of other people that I see have chewed in, but there's probably 10 of us. And I stuck it out for a couple of years. And those relationships that I built during that time were instrumental in 
building the future. Um, some of those relationships, you know, gave me my first job or introduced me to other people that were really influential in, in the boating marine world. Um, Russell Stevens later became head of education at the aquarium. And a good friend of mine, Mareka Masson, now heads up the education department and was the curator for a long time. So I have a very close relationship with the aquarium. And a, lot, a lot of my images are there. So always happy to, to give them as much as they want because they just do such incredible work. Um, so yeah, so that kicked me off in one in the path. I spent a year in Alawal Shoal working with tiger sharks, of all things, um, with, with a guy called Mark Addison. And then I came back to South Africa. Yeah. Is that it? That is a tiger That's shark. It. Yeah. That is a tiger shark. <laughs> so, so are you just, just, just fill me in here. You're, you're swimming, you've, you've, you're basically swimming with a tiger shark here. Shark here. There's no, there's no fear on your side getting into a water with, no, a, there, with a fish like there's this. Way, there's way more to the story than that. Let me see if I can find a picture. So, um, so that is actually a captured tiger shark. It was caught in the, in the Natal shark nets. So there's a whole bunch of barriers along the coastline in Durban that catches and kills sharks to protect them from bathers. Well, that's the theory, but they're, they're basically a gillnet fishery to remove sharks from the area. And there we go. And on our, um, on our tours every day, taking divers out to dive and enjoy the tiger sharks, we would always check out the nets on the way home. And that particular day, this youngster was stuck in the net, busy dying. And I jumped in and cut it out. And no worries. And then that, that, that top shot is afterwards. That's me trying to swim it loose and um, set it free. So I hope it survived, yeah. So this, I mean, this is an interesting picture and a half. So this is what we did, or, and, and it's still going on, um, but I was a guide for a year on Alawal Shoal. So Alawal Shoal is about, oh, I don't know, 50, 60 kilometers south of Durban. Um, it's a fossilized dune, so it comes up to about 15 meters. No, five, five meters to 15 meters on the shallow spots. And it's, it, was world, it is world famous for its shark numbers. At the moment, there's loads of black tips with the, the tiger sharks being not as common as they were. But when I was there, there was loads of them. And our, our job as a guide, and this is definitely the most risky job in the world, was to swim down that steel cable with Dorado carcasses, the, the fish, and tie <laughs> them on <onto> bait buckets. <laughs> and then... To let the let the sharks eat them and let the, the divers have a good time good time watching so the interesting thing about sharks is that they really don't they're very nervous they don't want anything to do with humans and um, putting in a little bit of bait to get them to not it's not interaction just to be in the area um, is well worth it so it's it's a licensed program there's the Department of Environmental Affairs is, controls it now and it's still still going on um, it's a, an, an incredible experience, very difficult conditions to work in, um, rough seas, strong currents. Um, it's one of those places that you, you want to go dive, but you're probably going to have to go a few times because it doesn't give itself up easily. Um, so yeah, so we, I spent a year just working with those, with those sharks. One, one of the experiences that I had there was, was, there was there was one shark called Matilda who had a, a squiggly spaghetti tag. A spaghetti tag is what scientists put in the backs of sharks so they can number them and identify them. And this tag was in skew, so we always knew who she was. And she was, a, she was always a grumpy shark. And I remember one day staring down the bait line, getting ready to swim to put my bait so the tourists could see the sharks. And I thought, yeah, it's all clear. It's fine. There's no sharks around. They're all aware. And I swam down, was tying, tying, tying. And I looked up and I saw all these photographers coming towards me, which wasn't normal. And I looked down and Matilda's whole mouth was, was like, like, you can't even see it. Her like, lower jaw was on my belly and the upper jaw was on my back. And I was like, I was fully inside her mouth. She'd rolled sideways. But tiger sharks never just come in and bite once. They always like come in slowly, do a couple pushes, test out things or not, things, and then bite properly. So I knew I had about two or three like mouth movements before I was in trouble. So I just pushed myself out of, the, out of her mouth and carried on with life. And I thought, well, that was a lucky one. So Insane. things can go put, wrong, but you've got to just know the animals, I guess. Eh? Yeah, I mean, put me in a line um, any day above a, a, a shark. <laughs> um, so, no. so, so this was, was this, this year that you spent here, was this before or after you studied? This is the year after I studied. 
So okay. I lied, like two years. I studied, I worked for one year doing in aquaculture. I was farming cobbleo and yellowtail for the, for the restaurant market. Um, and that was actually with Mareka Mussen, who was a woman that I'd met in my volunteer days at the aquarium. And, and yeah, so I ended up in Durban the year after that. And then now Mareka's moved to the aquarium. So Cape Town was my home. And that gets me back to your point after this mini digression is that the wildlife in Cape Town is unbelievable. Like the amount of diversity, like big animal diversity we have here is just, is just phenomenal. And so yeah, I've, that's a good, good one. And I've taken, you've, you've dived here, James, with me at the Cape Town. Yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, again, um, you know, and I see a couple of the African Lynx guys are, uh, are watching as well, you know. So how's it, Dan, SJ? Um, you know, one of the reasons for me wanting to connect with you was to just make use of such an amazing resource, which you, which you obviously are, and, and, and a specialist. And, um, you know, we've worked quite closely with you in, in you hosting, you know, private ocean safaris, um, and as well as um, introducing our guests to your, your seal snorkeling um, experience, which is absolutely unbelievable. And if, if any of you are, are traveling to Cape Town and have not done this experience, it is a, it's a must. So, I mean, let's talk a little bit about that. So, I mean, we're, we're both Cape Town... I'm not born and bred, but we both, you know, live in Cape Town. Um, I was amazed mm -hmm. at, again, how, you know, your wealth of knowledge and how you introduced me to a whole nother world. How did you start the, the business where you, you introduce clients to these beautiful Cape Fur Seals? Yeah, thanks, James. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, it started a little bit slowly. Like, at first, I, I wanted to come home to Cape Town after Durban with those tiger sharks. And I wanted to find an experience that could be predictable and safe and easy for everyone to enjoy. So just like I love going and uh, experiencing these large creatures, you know, humpback whales or tiger sharks or you name it, but you know, that's not for everyone. And I really wanted to find something. And the seals were the easy, most perfect choice because they're interactive, they're, um, you, you're not manipulating them. It's just them on their own terms. And the human is the one out of, the, out of their own element. So it really takes people out of their reality, their normal day-to-day -day lives, and puts them in a position with a large mammal that really wants to interact with them and, and underwater, which is like so many layers of removed from most people's worlds. Um, and it was also listening to, to my guests because you know you can, it's very easy to see when someone's happy and they comment and they tell you, and it just became obvious, like this, this is a real thing. People really appreciate this. So interestingly enough, I find, you know, South Africans see seals quite a lot just in the harbors and around the day-to-day -day life. But yeah. the international guests really appreciate them that more because they are super unique. And there's not a lot of places in the world that you can do this. I think there's, there's like Australia has got one or two places and maybe New Zealand. Like to have a colony that's shark-free in stable ocean conditions close to an international airport and city is really, really special. So... It's over the last 10 years is how long I've been doing this for. It's been, it's, it's certainly become as important as like, I think seeing Table Mountain or the Great White Sharks. It's become like the iconic, one of the iconic things that you can do. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And I think again, you know, your seals, um, you know, are, are, are the hook, but there's just so much more in terms of, you know, the possibilities of, of what you can see out there. You know, I've seen, Super pods of dolphins, um, you know, um, whales. Um, maybe you can give us an, an idea of, you know, some of the other, um, you know, some of the other amazing wildlife encounters one can have around Cape Town. You know, a city that that you and I call home. I'll bring up a couple of photographs here, I think, yeah. as well, um, that you can talk to. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So that's a, that's a, that's what guests look like seal snorkeling. Yeah, James. That that photo is a great photo. So. That's a humpback whale breaching under the 12 Apostles mountain range here in Cape Town. It's on the Atlantic side. And that particular breach, one of those photos, maybe that one, was used for the, the Netflix Our Planets um, promotional material. So I've got this, there's a video of like Prince, uh, was it Prince Harry or Prince Charles next to David Attenborough with that photo massive behind them. So awesome. very, 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 very proud and happy to have that reach that level but so humpback whales in particular i have 
experienced a huge rebound in numbers since they've stopped hunting, stopped bin hunting. Um, and there were some huge, you know, South Africa whaled a lot, you know, in Durban and Betty's Bay and Longabarn. They had, it was, a, it was a thing. So that's all stopped. Um, how when, you say, whales, when, you, when you say they've, um, you know, they've stopped hunting, was that, are you talking about commercial whaling? Um, was commercial whaling stopped in the 80s for everyone? Was that, uh, sorry to, to kind of, uh, you know, diverge here. I just wanted to, to clarify yeah, that. Yeah. I'm going to have to check out my facts on that, to be honest. Maybe, I'll, maybe okay. our viewers know more than me. We'll, I'll watch yeah. the comments. But I think it was stopped internationally. There are still some countries that carry on, you know, the Japanese and the Norwegians, I think. And there is some still, there's still a fair amount of subsistence traditional whaling going on. But in general, humpbacks that are feeding in the, in the Antarctic and traveling to the equator are left alone and they, they still have things to fear which is like plastic ingestion getting hit by ships you know but but not actually having a harpoon thrown in their back yeah um so yeah they're back in large numbers in cape town and what normally happens is around november the, the family groups all travel to west africa to gabon and the equator where they're mating and giving birth but the youngsters that are like you know two or three years old they they're not sexually mature. They don't have to do that. And they stay now, they stay around Langabon because Langabon is a super, super productive upwelling cell. So there's a lot of food in that whole area between Padanosta, Santa Lina Bay, Langabon, that area there. And we, we were lucky, not lucky, but a couple of years ago, the, the feeding group traveled past Cape Town. And that's when you can get good visibility for filming. So between November and February, these supergroups come past. And if you're driving on Camps Bay or you uh, are sitting on Signal Hill and you look out to sea, you have a good chance of seeing loads of spouts and breaching and just whales being whales off the South African coast. So like often people ask like, when is the whale season in Cape Town? And like at the moment, to, to be honest, it's year round. Like we have humpbacks from November to February and then the Southern rights start to come. Um, and these lot of stragglers stay around. Um, go for it. Uh, no, I mean, it's just so nice to see guys engaging here. You know, Otto, who we both know, um, checking up on, on the ban and, uh, you know, looks like, according to Google, you know, uh, end of, uh, you know, the 70s. And then I think a great um, question from the Green Renaissance guys, how's it? Thanks for tuning in. Um, is talking about the, the huge aggregations of um, humpbacks that... Uh, that we've seen last year. Do you know anything about that, Steve? You, you care to talk to that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, last year was just one of the years. Um, last year, they, they, they came in like December, I think, and the whales left quite late, like even February or March, they were still in Centralina Bay. And that, that's been pretty typical of the pattern that has been happening in the last sort of five years. Um, there was a scientist, the whole group, Ndu and Ken Findlay, the guys were monitoring the whales that were passing up in the Santalina area and doing counts. Um, so there's been a lot of research um, on the supergroups, they call them. And then there's an the aerial, aerial and underwater photographer for Jean Trespin that has also created some great images from the air of the, the huge numbers of whales. Um, but there's a, for anyone watching in the Netflix, um, Netflix series, Our Planet, there's an amazing sequence where you can see all the best footage that Roger Horrocks, the, the main cameraman filmed I've got one little clip in there that I'm super proud of, but um, the rest of the time I was assisting and helping and doing logistics for that particular shoot. But anything that allows me to spend more time on the water um, with these animals is where I want to be. Yeah, so you just, you just brought up dusky dolphins and that's, you know, it's a beautiful dolphin species that we have in abundance here in Cape Town. Um, duskies are mostly found on the Atlantic side. They're super playful. You'll see, you'll see them jumping in the waves and, and doing backflips. Um, if you ever go and take a stand-up paddleboard off Lindudno or Camps Bay and you have dolphins coming cruise underneath you, it's, it's probably these guys. You must have seen them too. I, I have. Um, and that's something that I've got into since uh, moving to Cape Town is, is jumping on a, a paddleboard. I've um, I've seen um, what must be between she's 400 and 500 dolphins swimming into the Bay of Hart Bay before. Are we, are we, is that a slightly different species? So we get common dolphins and dusky dolphins doing that. You know, if you see them in false bay, it's probably the common dolphins. Um, okay. I, I have seen groups 
like you described, or 400 duskies. So it could have been either, but um, I would say mostly it's the commons that we see. So interesting. Yeah, okay. You pull that. <laughs> that's the, a mug shot of a, a very famous southern elephant seal right there. Um, well, good one. Okay, so that, I, 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 I had to do it. I had to do it. Oh, is it my mug shot or is it, is it, is it an actual seal? Eh? <laughs> no, no. This is, this is your shot of an actual seal. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, we've been seeing some bizarre things in Cape Town recently, haven't we, as well, with uh, the king penguin of Cape Point and, uh, you know, uh, the, this elephant There's seal, which, uh, which, which I've seen actually, I think, being on the boat with you in Hop Bay. You have, you have. So, so this particular elephant seal, well, everyone watching is called Buffle. Otto knows it. There he is, Buffle. Katie, thank you, Buffle. Um, <laughs> oh, he's so famous, anyone, eh? Anyone who's not from Cape Town, we're not, we're not norm, we don't normally have that seal. Danny, you got it right, Buffle. <laughs> um, so southern elephant seals are not supposed to be in Cape Town. And this one, we think, was born in Cape Town by a vagrant mother that gave birth in Olifant's boss in Cape Point. There's a photo uh, of a juvenile seal weaning and suckling at the time. So he believes he's Cape Townian, and he's certainly shown that because he, he repeatedly comes back. He, he was actually tagged by a scientist called Steve Kirkman on Buffles Bay in Cape Point. So he, we know who he is because of his, the number on his hind flipper. Um, Southern elephant seals are the largest pinnipeds on the planet. So the, the walruses, seals, and fur seals are all called pinnipeds. And he's, he will be one of the biggest. Um, I think they can get to two or three tons. So absolutely massive. And they wow. can, and they can dive to 2000 meters. So unbelievably deep. And they, they, the nose looks massive, but they have an equally large mouth hidden underneath all that, that nose. Um, but can you imagine diving to 2000 meters? I mean, that is I completely can't. black. No, no, like uh, it's, it, like the, some of the deepest diving animals are, were thought to be sperm whales and beaked whales. But it turns out southern elephant seals dive equally as deep. Um, you know, measuring how deep, dive, how deep animals dive is really hard and a bit hit and miss because you, you have to put your scientific tag on an animal during a short amount of time that bothers to swim super deep. And they don't normally swim super deep unless there's a reason to, like, like food or something like that. Um, there's a, there's that, a question. There's a question that's come in in terms of the the nose. Um, why do they have such large noses, Steve? Is that an adaptation <laughs> that Otto, benefits them? Uh, no, or, absolutely. So thanks, Otto. Otto is like a seal expert. He's spent a lot of time on Marion Island. He he's a he's a he knows all about elephant seals. So as far as I know, elephant seals produce a really loud, loud noise when they're busy displaying. The beach masters, the the big males that are defending their harems on the beach, first try separate themselves out and show their dominance by having these huge nasal gro gr like growls and roars. Uh, and they do that before they come into proper head-on conflicts, which they do. Um, so as far as I know, it's a, also when they're on the beach, they're not eating and they're also trying to conserve as much water as possible. So the nose thing amongst males is a display um, I, I don't know. When you do, it, how how do elephants ever use vocal vocalizations to assert dominance? You know, if I was to re relate that back to a large bush animal, yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I mean you're you're spot on. I mean elephants, elephant bulls will vocalize during you know territorial clashes, um, and yeah, I mean you know those trumpets can be heard from you know a huge distance. So you know they'll use they'll use their their the audio to to warn off predators and you know warn off uh, any threats as well. So yeah, I guess a similar similar adaptation. Nice, yeah. And so so Buffle there is photographed on Fisher Beach. So he came ashore to molt. So every year elephant seals have to shed their skin. So they have a huge number of mechanisms that allow them to dive super deep for like up to an hour and a half. So they, they, they have a, a, like they shut down the blood to most of their body, except the, the main parts. They have, they have hemoglobin like we do, but in much higher concentrations. Uh, that, that's, that's the part that the blood, that oxygen attaches to the blood. So they can hold more oxygen in their blood than we can. They also have myoglobin, which is another oxygen-attracting chemical in their muscles. 
um, that it's like a, they, they super saturate the whole body with oxygen. And I believe they actually breathe out when they go for a long dive down. Um, okay. Because all air spaces when they're diving are going to be completely crushed. So, and then, then they, they have things in the brain, they have things in the eyes, they, and then their heart beats really slowly. So they, they really shut down everything possible to allow that ability to dive super deep and for super long. And all in quest of some food. Awesome, man. I guess, again, just testament to, you know, just all this, the diversity of species that we have literally, you know, in our backyard as Cape Tonians. So, um, you know, again, again, Steve, I must thank you for kind of opening my eyes to that. And it, it really was an awakening for me with regards to, to realizing what we, what we had um, on our doorstep, you know. No, absolutely. Um, so much. Let's see if I can um, pull up another here. Um, so these, I want to show you some common dolphins. These are the ones we spoke about that you mentioned. So these are really the ones you might find in False Bay in huge numbers. Um, that is a whale. That is a ruggy. Let's go. It's back to the common dolphin. There we go. Um, so, I mean, James, you know, we have, we have orcas that are in False Bay occasionally. And when they're here, they're busy hunting this species of dolphin, which is incredible. So, like, that's the largest marine predator that you have on the whole planet. Um, and they come in, unfortunately, for the common dolphins to hunt them. Um, we also have um, bottlenose dolphins and humpback dolphins. But if you see a big pod out to sea, you will probably be the common dolphin. Okay. Awesome, man. Um, I, yeah, I've yet to see um, orca or killer whales in, um, in, the, in the Western Cape waters. So, um, yeah, where can, where can one look out for them? Jeez, you have to be really lucky. Um, you know, guys have spotted them from the, from the land at Glen Ken and uh, Simonstown occasionally. Um, I know, so two weeks ago, the orcas came three times into False Bay. And there's a guy called Dave Hurwitz who has the whale watching license in False Bay. And he regularly posts uh, photos of those, uh, those orcas coming in. Um, you know, like in the rest of the world, you have to go to Norway to like do a focused orca experience. But basically, it's random. It's hit and miss. They come and go. Um, and you have to just count your blessings when you get the chance to see them. I've been super lucky. I've managed to see them or get in the water three times with them. Um, or every occasion was not expected, and you just have to take advantage of it when you can. So in awesome. particular, yeah, we were, I was in Galapagos for a while um, with Otto, who's busy watching, um, and we happened to come across, you know what, actually, Otto, Otto had a dream that morning, and he woke up. We were on a liverboard boat, and he woke up the whole boat, Orcas, the orcas, there's the orcas here, and we and we all got super excited, and we 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 all got up and we went to the and we searched, and I, I, and there wasn't an orca at all. There was like there was nothing, if I remember correctly. Maybe there was a dolphin, but there was nothing. But it was later that exact day that there was a radio call that there were orcas. So somehow he maybe he was just tuned into the orcaness of the situation, but he had a premonition and. <laughs> There were, that random day that you can never predict, he woke everyone up and there were orcas. And we went out to sea and uh, the water was really dirty, but we got in anyway. And the orcas at the time were eating turtles. So it didn't actually, it wasn't, like the frigate birds would come down, they would eat the scraps of the turtles in bad visibility and then we jumped in, which probably wasn't the greatest idea, but we did it anyway. And we had a few passes, the orcas it basically ignored us. Um, because see like a giant dorsal fin and then back into the green. Um, and that was, that, was a, that was a cool experience, not something I expected. Otto um, saying it was quite awkward. <laughs> so, man, amazing. And it's so cool to see how many people are, you know, are responding to, to this conversation, Steve. Um, Jill, all the way from British Columbia, is saying, um, you know, she sees pods um, you know, obviously where she's from and, um, wow. and Sh Shamia said she saw nine orcas just two weeks ago. So, so really, really, really awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. mate, we are, she's, we are flying through this hour. It's so scary. What? How, How's that only 15 how, minutes left? 
Yeah, so I think it would be really good. It's something that I want to learn a little bit more about as well. And I, you know, I, I wanted to read a little bit about it before chatting to you, um, you know, about the sardine run. And you actually can't find too much information on the sardine run. Um, so no. it would be really, really great to hear a little bit more, um, you know, about your experience. You've obviously, I don't know how many times, how many years you've actually followed, um, you know, the sardine run. Um, it's been compared to... Um, you know, the in terms of its sheer size and, and, and weight, I guess, in terms of the, the migration up in East Africa, our, our, um, our mammal migration. Um, so, yeah, it would be great to just hear a little bit more about the actual sardine run. Um, does it happen every year? And, um, and what are some of the experiences you've had following the sardine run? Okay. Yeah, I mean, the sardine run is a huge topic. Let's, should we play, I'll play a little video clip and see if we can get this preempted. Okay, cool. So, so this is a bait ball that we filmed for BBC's Nature's Great Events. And what it shows is really this bombardment of gannets that are chasing sardines underwater. And it's, when you're actually there, it's just unbelievable because you can smell the feathers in the air and you can, it sounds like bullets. Because these gannets are not small birds. I think they're like a kilo and a half or two kilos and they've got a, a, a big wingspan. And they're underwater with sharks whales and dolphins chasing fish and like when they're underwater they like they are relentless they'll catch a fish swallow it catch another one and then chase their mate and steal his one and then swallow that one and then come <laughs> up and you think you're starving because he's still determined to catch more fish like gannets will eat fish until they can't fly anymore they'll just sit on the surface um yeah and this this happens somewhere between east london and durban and yeah, look at, I mean, like, it looks like fish under there. There's so many. Let me flick, flick this back. Um, so the sardine run really is a, it's a winter migration of the eastern population of sardines moving up to Durban. And they spawn along the way. And it has to happen during winter because the sardines move in, very, in cold water that is trapped up against the coastline as the Agalas current, which is hot, comes down the coast. Makes so you sense. need cold water and, yeah, and storms. And the, this allows the fish to travel in eddies and get to Durban. Um, so the, the, the sardine eggs want to end up back on the Agullis uh, banks, which is sort of the East London to Cape Town area, where it's nutrient rich and they can feed and grow up. So it is like a big loop. So they're traveling along the coast, exploring along the way and coming back. So that's the, that's the theory. What, what, what happens in reality is tougher because, you know, the, the fish need to follow the cold water. So they might go super deep and you won't ever see them. And they'll pop up in Durban without having been accessible to divers. Or sometimes, you know, a piece might get halfway and then the conditions aren't right. So it stops and then it, it, it comes back and then it might carry on. So it's this, it's the, it was more predictable. Um, and, but it does happen between June and August. That, that is the one thing that is consistent. It needs the winter swells. And, and guys access it from East London, the Transkei, and um, sort of lower, lower south coast a bit. But yeah, that's a photo of us um, in Ndumbi launching the boat. And that's where we head every year um, and launch. I love that place because it's got an, an amazing wave, an easily accessible surf launch. Um, it has generally great visibility. Um, and yeah, this is us out on the water in that part of the coastline filming to try to capture it. Um, yeah, and so some things you need to know as a, as a client wanting to go on a sardine run is that you need to have as much time as possible because you, you really are, it is really an ocean safari. You don't know what you're going to see every day. You also need to go with the expectation of like, absorbing all the moments so you might it's, it's like going to kruger park expecting to see a lion kill like yeah you can't like yeah you if you give yourself maximum time you might and if you're with the right people you might but you don't know like it may or may not happen um and like like going to the kruger you obviously you know you're not on a you're not on a uh, you know four by four vehicle but you're in a boat looking for um, you know, other species of animals giving away the presence of the sardines or are you just looking for the um, sardines themselves? Yeah, so, so you look, you, you're basically looking for heightened activity amongst the predators. So that's the gannets and the dolphins. 
they, they won't, they, they'll also eat other species besides sardine. So we have, we have well, a whole range. So we have herring, which form loose, fast moving shoals, and they're not, they don't ever stay static that's able to dive on. So that, those are better to snorkel on. Um, also, they, the herring forms smaller numbers, so the bait balls don't last very long because if the gannets don't eat them, then the tuna will, or, or, or the dolphins will eat them. So that's tricky. Then we have these things called sauries, which are long and thin, and like they're often called half beaks. They have a little pointy nose, but they never form shoals. They only ever sit on the surface and in ones and twos. So you'll see hundreds of dolphins chasing and birds diving, but there's no actual focal point to dive on. Um, and then you get anchovies, which are really small. They form these like, mer like mercury little bait balls, but they're also really easily eaten. So they don't last that long. So the ultimate one is to find sardines, which are slow moving um, in huge numbers where the animals are really hammering it for a long period of time. So you ha by looking at a bait ball, I can understand, I know what species it is just by the behavior of the, of the animals around it. And it also matters whether the bait ball is shark dominated or dolphin dominated because it, it creates a completely different atmosphere. So, so that is actually a, a macro shark, which you find off, uh, off Cape Town. Um, I have seen them on the sardine run behind the dolphins once, but, um, but not, not that often. Um, but uh, there we go. So that's the typical feathers everywhere, birds going crazy. They are super loud. They're like, they, they, they're just the best thing when you can find that concentration of gannets. Um, so, so last year, we had an incredible year. Um, the, most of July in that wild coast, Port St. John's and Dumbi area, we, we had probably had a good vapor every day or two, which was, which was, I was very, very happy with that. Um, and there was just, it was just, a, it was a year of good visibility with small vapor, but really intense. Um, we had a few shark bait balls, and the difference with those is that the sh sharks don't coordinate um, very well amongst each other. It's all just basically a, a free-for-all to get as much food as possible. So the birds behave frantically because there's the, the, the fish are just in such a frenzy, and the, the birds take advantage of the, the fishes. Like they're not paying attention because they're getting attacked by sharks. So the birds take advantage of that and get them. What you find with a, with a dolphin dominated bait ball is that the dolphins coordinate themselves and they go through a bait ball at one time. And then there might be a minute or two of like just relaxation. Then they burst through again because the dolphins understand that they can work together and all get fish. And then what the birds do the same, the birds dive and then back off. So you get a more pulsing action with the one and a more fr frantic with the other. Um, but yeah, and then amongst that, we have humpbacks on migration, so loads of breaching. And we also have the just bottlenose dolphins surfing. Yeah, and that particular photo is one of my like all-time best, to be honest. Um, it's a sorry humpback whale. It, yeah, sorry I cut it off there, but I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I'm, I'm just blown away looking at this image. I mean, how you, how you manage to capture it at you know, a fraction of a second is just unbelievable. Yeah. The, and you know that that pectoral fin is like five meters long. Eh? Just that that, no that, that the one, they are massive animals. Um, so so interestingly enough, on flat, calm days like this, you often get whales that are in a breaching cycle. So you might have to sit next to one for an hour or two, and they'll do these half breaches over and over. They're just in like a happy, playful mood. Um, I see a question here: Do you find humpbacks bubble net feeding? Um, and it's interesting we don't. So the our whales. Uh, in South Africa that go past don't produce those bubble nets that you see in British Columbia that are uh, eating fish. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know why. It, it, different cultures, different learning, different hunting techniques. Our whales are definitely on a migration. So they're moving through the area. And, and just like this photograph, um, the whales will, will do a breaching pattern. And I think breaching is for communication, sometimes for irritation if they've got skin parasites. And also sometimes for just, uh, just showing dominance to other individuals in the area. Um, but on this day, we were really close. And if you give animals, as you know, time just to accept your presence, then it's fine. You can, do, you can just be there. Another boat came through and disturbed them. And 
that sort of stopped him breaching for a while. Um, and I remember sitting with my hot chocolates, eating my, my, my biscuits. It was a very calm period. And the boat went away and we were alone. And I just looked at the whale and he did a, he did a dive. And I thought, I wonder what he's going to do now. Is he going to be as playful as he was earlier? And that was the first breach that came up. I set my focus, took the shot. And I remember during the, my, the camera rolling, looking to my right and just seeing all the other photographers next to me still not paying attention. <laughs> uh, I thought, Gosh, I'm a terrible guide, but I've got a great photo. And, and then the next breach was really good and the next one was good. But it was that first moment that really was, uh, was, was good. So, so that photo sat on my hard drive for years, for like three or four years. And eventually I sold it to, well, I licensed to, to a company called Barcraft Media, which is generally like a, a mass production. They just, they just threw it out to the world and made up a story with it, you know, whale waves at photographer. Um, and then it, it, it took a life of its own. Now it's everywhere. It's, uh, it goes viral very often. And it's, it's, I think it's been released. I mean, it's not, people don't even know that I took it. Um, but there it is. It's got us. It, it's fine. I don't mind at all. It's, it's, it's living a life showing people nature. And that's cool. Um, just, uh, just staying with, uh, you know, just another image that I want to show. And uh, that's only because we're running out of time here, Steve, if you Thank could you. just chat to, um, is, is this image as well, which I think, you know, just, is, <laughs> is just such an amazing capture. Um, and I'm assuming, I'm assuming that's a Cape fur seal. Yeah. So that is down the throat of a Cape fur seal. Uh, that, that photo, um, it's not being aggressive. That's a playful seal. Um, I'm shooting with a, with a, a Takina 10mm lens. It's really, really wide. And if you look at the nose, you'll see that its fur is flat. And that, that's because it's literally squashed itself onto my dome port. So <laughs> it's really close. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> underwater photography is all about lighting, in, in my opinion. I really love um, some ghosting to try add some motion and to try some beautiful lighting. And in, and in Cape Town, you have to get close to your subjects because the water is not always very clean. And so you have to remove that, um, that barrier from your photos. And yeah, um, I managed to, I won the Getaway magazine contest for that. And I won a 70 Mark II and a 70 to turn more lens. So it really like, that photo really kicked me up into a more professional level where I could have equipment like that because I certainly couldn't afford it at the time. Um, and yeah, you know, that photo has helped um, many seal snorkelers come and try experience too. And um, I really uh, that that's a, one of my one of my top five or well, no top ten good photos. Awesome, Steve. Um, but we're running out of time here. I, I see know. Got, Can't believe we've it. Got, yeah, we've got about two minutes, and it's just been so awesome. And I guess testament to you again in terms of just how much <laughs> uh, engagement we've had. You know, lots of people. Um, yeah. You know, lots of people I see, I see engage. Mike, thank you, Mike. Mike Ramondo, yeah, he's a he's a familiar name. How's it, Mike? Um, and I think maybe um, you can see it's getting dark my side as well. Um, but maybe no, just to end off, uh, end off, Steve, with regards to just some of the threats that our um, local oceans um, and the marine life is facing. Uh, kind of what what's happen happening currently? Um, maybe we can talk from a, a local perspective. Um, yeah. And again, and again, just I'm going to end now just to give you an opportunity to chat. But for those of you who want to learn a little bit more about um, Steve Benjamin, Animal Ocean, Steve, you'll send me a link. I'll pop it in, um, you know, my, my bio and people can learn a bit more about, um, you know, who you are and what you do and also get in touch with you with regards to the services you offer and possibly joining you on a sardine run. Um, so um, look out for that link, guys. If you are interested in, in connecting with Steve, alternatively, go follow him, check out his awesome page, and you just connect with him directly. Um, but yeah, Steve, again, if you could just end off giving us a, a you know, paint a picture for yeah, us in terms stupid. of... Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, you know, the ocean faces massive problems. You know, just ocean pollution, ocean, ocean acidification, overfishing. Um, Locally, there's a huge number of organizations. Some of them are people who are watching this right now who are really making a huge effort. Um, you know, in the ground, when I'm in the shops, like w, uh, WWF Sassy lets people make great choices about what fish to eat, you know, the green, green fish, not using fish that are um, getting over, overfished. Um, 
there's a lot of community groups that are collecting plastic off the beach and doing ocean conservation and awareness programs. Um, people really care how uh, making, making a change. So there's a lot that needs to be done, of course. Um, but it's encouraging that so many people are do, doing their best to try. Uh, um, so I, don't, I know that doesn't answer your question fully, but it is, it, it, locally there's a lot going on. No, well, thanks, Steve. And again, I mean, we're about to be cut off, but, uh, you know, thanks again for everything that you do and being such a great ambassador for our marine life. Cheers.